Hi, I'm Heidi Johnson, the Crops and Soils Educator for Dane County UW Extension, and I'm going to be talking about pests and pest management. The most important thing when you are thinking about managing pests is to first identify the problem with the plants that you're having, and that's the only way that you can truly find a way to solve the problem. Pesticides aren't always appropriate for every situation. This is an example of a cucumber seedling that actually has some frost damage and you can see the uh, white whitening of the leaves on both the, the first leaves and then the first true leaf that's coming out here. And this is just frost damage. This isn't from a pest of any kind and likely the plant will grow out of it. This is an example of a problem that cannot be solved with pesticides. Similarly, this is a problem called blossom end rot. Uh, the, you see the spot here on the bottom of the tomato and this looks like it would be a fungal disease but it actually is a physiological problem with the plant that's caused by not enough calcium making it into the fruit. Calcium travels through the plant through water so usually blossom end rot comes when watering is not consistent uh, during the growing season and you can tell it's blossom end rot because it's on the exact bottom opposite of uh, the, where the fruit is hanging from the plant. It's on the exact bottom and it's a, just uh, usually a round uh, shape there that turns brown and kind of scaly. Pesticides will not help at all with this problem. Likewise, adding more calcium to the soil won't help with this problem. Consistent watering throughout the growing season is what's necessary to try to avoid this. And sometimes even with best management practices, growers still have this problem throughout the season. But it's important to remember that using any kind of a fungicide will not solve this. Uh, it's just a problem that you need to live with. Also, this is an edible fruit. This can just be cut off, um, but obviously not ideal for marketing this uh, to consumers. This is also a tomato plant, and you can see the purpling on the edges of the leaves. And this is uh, typical of a potassium deficiency. I'm sorry, a phosphorus deficiency. <laughs> Keep doing that. Uh, so this is from not having enough um, of one of the major nutrients, which is phosphorus. So a grower can solve this problem by using additional fertilizer or compost. This cannot be uh, solved by using any type of pesticide. This uh, whitening and bleaching of the leaves is actually caused from herbicide drift. And that means that a herbicide that cucumbers is, are sensitive to was used nearby and it drifted onto this plant and caused some damage. This bleaching effect is characteristic of a certain class of herbicides and you really won't see this kind of damage done from any other kind of pest. So if you see bleaching like that, you can assume that you used a herbicide incorrectly near to this plant. Uh, this, uh, so you've noticed in the last couple of slides, these are all things that were not solved by pesticides. And we're going to look a, at another couple of things too. This is all plant damage from a non-living agent. So this is ginseng here, and you can see all the leaves on this plant are yellow. And this is actually caused from sun scald. Uh, ginseng is grown in the shade, and so if exposed to too much light, the le uh, leaves will bleach out and, and will look this yellowish uh, color. This can also happen with seedlings that are started in the greenhouse and then moved out too quickly. The, light, the leaves don't have enough time to adjust to the increase in sunlight and they actually get a sunburn just like a human would. A lot of times a plant can grow out of this damage and no pesticide would help in any way, shape or form. This is another type of nutrient deficiency, but this is uh, nitrogen. Nitrogen deficiencies are characteristic by yellow on the leaf, but then a green veins are still remaining. And so if you have plants that show this yellowing with the green veins, you can assume that you have a nitrogen deficiency and that can be solved by adding additional fertilizers or compost to the soil. This is actually a bean plant Beans are a legume and actually produce their own nitrogen. So I would assume if this uh, bean plant is pr showing uh, nitrogen deficiency, that means that the plant roots are not nodulated and so then they're not making their own nitrogen. So that's a problem um, in, the, in the rooting system and could be solved by inoculating the soil 
with the inoculant you need for this plant to uh, be able to produce nitrogen. This is an example of a bean plant that was coming out of the soil when the soil was crusted over. So if you put the seed into the ground and then you get some very heavy rains, you can get a crust on the surface of the soil, particularly soils that have, been, uh, have seen a lot of tillage. And so as the seedling tried to break, free, break through the soil surface, it got damage on the cotyledon leaves coming through. The plant will grow out of this. Uh, nothing is necessary. This growing tip is what's really important. And those cotyledon leaves were protecting that growing tip as they came out of the soil. So the no pesticide will help with this. This is just uh, something that can sometimes happen and the plant should grow through it. This is a tomato plant showing an example again of a different type of herbicide damage. Uh, some of the growth, regular herbic growth regulator herbicides will cause this uh, curling of, of the leaves and you might even see curling of the growing tip of the plant. And that would mean that you used a growth regulator herbicide somewhere nearby and it ended up on your tomato plants causing this kind of damage. Tomatoes are particularly sensitive to the growth regulator herbicides, as are raspberries and grapes. Um, they are also very sensitive, so you have to be very careful where you're using these herbicides near these sensitive plants. If a plant does show this type of damage, it's probably best to get rid of it. You don't want a herbicide that doesn't belong on a plant on a plant because then consumers will be eating food from that plant and it's not safe the, because this plant is not labeled for this herbicide. Uh, this is corn seedlings that are gr being grown in a very sandy soil. And when you're growing in a very sandy soil and you get heavy winds, you can get something called sand blasting on the leaves, where the sand particles from the soil are hitting the leaves and causing uh, damage to them. Pesticides aren't going to do you any good in this uh, example either. The plant should grow through this. Again, the growing tip is down here and should be protected from a lot of that, uh, that sand blasting and be able to grow through it. Um, this is an example of hail damage to strawberries. Um, it sometimes can resemble uh, some type of insect damage because you're getting holes on the leaves, but uh, the whole plant being um, matted down like that and holes on the leaves and likely the grower noticed that the hail was coming down because it's very loud. Um, so this is characteristic of what hail damage would look like. Again, not solved with a pesticide, uh, just something physical that's happened to the plant. So those are all examples of things, damage caused to plants from non-living agents that pesticides wouldn't help with. Now we're going to talk about damage to plants from living agents. And the three primary types of living agents that we uh, have as pests for our food are insects, diseases, and weeds. And we're going to start to go through those uh, next. But before we do that, we're going to review the vegetable plant families. And why is this important? It's important because uh, particularly for the insects and the diseases, they tend to attack a family of vegetables. So in the case of insects, they have overcome plant defenses in a certain family. And so they'll usually attack a certain family of plants. So knowing which of your plants are related to each other will help you to predict what type of insects you'll see damage from, likewise with diseases. It's not as important for weeds because weeds are generally just a competitor with, uh, with our vegetable plants. So reviewing the plant families so you know what are related to each other. The first family is the alliums and this is going to include the leeks, onions, garlics, and shallots. The second family is the carrot family and this would include carrots, celery, parsnips, and parsley. The sunflower family includes lettuce, endive, and salsify. The mustard family, which is also called the brassicas, is one of our bigger vegetable families. Um, and this would be the broccolis, cauliflower, cabbage, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, kale, collard greens, and rutabaga. They are all related to each other very closely. And you, you know that usually because they all have a very distinct smell. The goosefoot family includes Swiss chard, beets, and spinach. 
the sweet potato family, is, the only vegetable that we eat from that family is sweet potatoes. People often think that sweet potatoes are related to potatoes because of their similar growth habit and um, the look to them, but they're actually unrelated to each other. The cucurbit family is another one of our very big vegetable families. This includes cucumbers, summer squash, melons, pumpkins, and winter squash. The legume family includes peas, snap beans, lima beans, and soybeans. And these are the nitrogen fixing plants. They produce their own nitrogen, so they don't need a nitrogen fertilizer. The other uh, final big vegetable family is the solanaceous family. And this is where potatoes are. And potatoes are closely related with eggplants, tomatoes, and peppers. We're going to talk about insects first for pests. There's two types of insects, uh, two types of insect mouth parts, and those can categorize your, and they do different types of damage to the vegetables and can help you to categorize what kind of insect you have. These are the chewing and the sucking. So chewing, as you would expect, is insects that have chewing mouth parts, similar to ours, where they rip off pieces of leaves or stems and chew them up. And the damage from chewing mouths uh, chewing mouth part insects is very easy to identify because there are missing pieces of your leaves or your stems. This particular insect is a tobacco hornworm and they are generally found on tomatoes uh, as well. Uh, this guy down here is a very slimy little creature called a slug, and this slug is feeding on ginseng, but slugs are a problem on lots of different uh, types of plants, not just our vegetable plants, but uh, lots of ornamentals as well. Slugs feed at night, so if a users have seen this chewing damage to your plants, but you're not seeing the uh, the culprit. Likely it probably is slugs, but they're hiding under, under the residue on the soil surface during the day, and then they come out at night to feed. This little insect um, is a perfect example of an insect that attacks pretty much just one family of plants. This is the flea beetle, and this attacks the brassica plants uh, pretty specifically. And flea beetles will cause this characteristic Hole, uh, shotgun holes in the in the leaves and you can see where their little chew where they're starting to get through the leaf but they haven't gotten through and then the full shotgun effect where they've actually chewed a hole in the leaf. Uh, these guys are out during the day but they're small so you have to make sure you see them. They're usually hopping between the plants and um, so you can generally uh, find them pretty easily. This is a Colorado potato beetle. Not, it's probably a very, very common thing for most people that grow potatoes to see. There's several different um, growth stages of the potato beetle. This happens to be the pupil stage, which is the stage that is um, like a cocoon of a butterfly where their jades just stay completely still on the plant while they're going through metamorphosis. Prior to this, they are a, uh, a lar in the larval stage where they crawl around and they don't have any wings. And then after this stage, they become an adult, which is the big uh, yellow and black beetle that we often see on potatoes. Both the larval stage and the adult stage both will feed on potato plants. And characteristic damage from a chewing insect. You see there's lots of missing pieces here on this plant. And anybody that grows potatoes know that Colorado potato beetles can work pretty quickly to decimate your potato crop. So the other uh, mouth part of insects is a sucking mouth part. And these are a little bit more difficult to diagnose because this sucking mouth part uh, pierces into the plant like a straw and sucks the plant juices out. So you're not actually seeing the chewing damage, you're seeing the effects of the insect removing sap from the plant. What does that look like? Uh, it looks a little bit different in different plants, but it can cause yellowing and um, a suckering up of the plant where it looks like it's not doesn't have enough water in it. Um, so it can look a little bit different depending on the plant and the insect that did the damage. But these little guys are aphids, and these are uh, 
one of the most prevalent types of sucking mouth part sucking mouth part insects that we have that do damage to different plants there's lots of different kinds of aphids they can be black red yellow orange pink any pretty much any color you can think of there's probably an aphid that's that color they're generally on the underside of the leaf you can tell this is the underside of a soybean leaf they're very tiny and they have the the young stage is even smaller and this is likely an adult and that's about as big as they get so you have to really try to see them when they're in low numbers when they're in high numbers you can't miss them because they will generally be covering the entire underside of a leaf this is a four-lined plant bug and this is a problem on ginseng and this is a more of a traditional sucking mouth part insect that's going to be sucking the plant juices and causing that desiccated look to the plant so we're going to move on from insects to diseases um, what the most important thing to remember with diseases is not only do you have to have the right plant and the right disease that that disease can attack that plant but weather is very important for diseases uh, diseases uh, like fungal diseases and viruses they don't have legs they can't move around on their own so they're very dependent on wind and rain um, uh, or other things to move them around and they often dry out very easily so having enough moisture uh, is usually very important for fungal diseases or other type of diseases to stay alive. Uh, this is a, a leaf spot on tomatoes and there's several different types of leaf spots um, but this shows a characteristic pattern of a fungal disease leaf spot. So you see the brown in the center and then you get what we call a halo around that which is a yellowing around that center um, dot. Usually you'll see this on the bottom of the plants and then it moves up and this is because it's overwintering on the leaf letter on the soil surface and then it gets blown or splashed up onto the new plant the next year. So if you're, the way to take care of these types of fungal diseases is to be cleaning up the residue at the end of the season. When, if you're leaving that residue there, you're leaving the disease there and it infects your plants the next year. Um, this is an example of damping off and this is a fungal disease that's living in the soil and so often we get this problem with soil uh, with seedlings that are grown in the greenhouse and that's because the fungal disease is in the soil if you use that soil over again it can infect your plants the next year and these are characteristic the plant looks like it's not getting enough water but actually the fungus is infecting the roots and so it's not allowing the plant to take up water and that's why it looks like it's not getting enough water people often try to solve this problem with more water which actually makes the problem worse because the fungus likes more water and so you end up making the making it much much worse for yourself and killing all of your seedlings you can not have this problem by using new soil every year and by cleaning up your trays or using new trays um, every year and if you do want to clean them you need to use a 10 percent bleach solution to make sure that fungus is killed uh, this is a fungal disease in uh, ginseng and you can see again that characteristic brown in the middle with the halo of discolored leaf around it this particular fungal disease is called alternaria. This is a slightly different looking fungal disease that many vegetable growers will be very familiar with late in the season. You'll often get this on your cucurbits, which is the cucumbers, melons, uh, squashes, and it's called powdery mildew. This fungal disease is a white fuzzy appearance on the leaf surface, and actually what you're seeing is the fungus and it's producing uh, spores on these fuzzy spots and then those spores are picked up by the wind and moved to new plants. We don't generally treat for this with a fungicide because it comes in late in the season and doesn't usually cause yield loss for vegetables. Phytophthora leaf blight, this is in ginseng. We also have a type of Phytophthora that infects uh, tomatoes and that's called leaf blight. And these are a very serious um, set of diseases because they cause, uh, they cause death to the plant. So it's, you, you lose the entire thing. It doesn't just cause a disease. We also can't use fungicides um, 
after we have the problem. It doesn't cure the problem. Fungicides only keep fungus from reinfecting. So you can only protect plants uh, with fungicides. So that's why it's very difficult once you get these types of diseases to get rid of them. Uh, bacterial diseases are a little bit different than fungal diseases and we actually don't really have any pesticides for bacterial diseases. Usually bacterial diseases are uh, are cause this like gross yucky um, breakdown of the plant and so when you break the stem you also often see oozing of the plant when you have bacterial diseases. This is an example called bacterial leaf spot on peppers and you see similar to the fungal disease you get spots but you don't have that halo around it. Bacterial spots often are irregular in shape as well where fungal diseases tend to be rounder dots on the leaves. Um, this is a bacterial disease as well, and you can see the, an example of that angular shape to the leaf spots rather than the circles that you see with a fungal disease. Here's a chart that just goes through the differences between fungal and bacterial diseases. A um, couple things of note is that with fungal diseases, the spots tend to be dry and papery. With bacterial diseases, they tend to be slimy and sticky. Uh, bacterial diseases tend to be stinky and have an, uh, an odor to them. And um, again, that halo is around that spot typically with fungal diseases, but not with bacterial diseases. The last disease we're going to talk about is viruses. And viruses are very, very, very tiny. And they cannot move around at all, even uh, with the wind or the rain, they really have to have something that moves them around. And often for our ve vegetable diseases, insects are the ones that are moving them from plant to plant. The viruses have found, evolved a way to live inside of the insect, and so they will remain inside of the insect, not harming the insect at all. But when the insect feeds on one plant, it will pick up a virus, it'll stay in the insect's body, the insect goes to a new plant to feed and it deposits that virus in the next plant. And this is how many of our viral diseases move around. So the only way to really solve this is actually to control the insect. So you have to know which insect is moving those viral diseases around. We can also move viral diseases around with equipment. So if you're tr pruning, um, something where you're cutting into the plant, you should always clean your uh, tools with a 10% bleach solution in between cuts or in between different plants to make sure that you're not spreading diseases. Uh, viral diseases usually make the plants look really weird and this is an example. They cause a discoloration, this mosaic pattern. This is cucumber mosaic virus and you can see that stippled uh, appearance to the leaves and the mosaic pattern on all the leaves and that's characteristic. You can also get you also get weird looking fruit so if you have bumps or discoloration on your fruit it probably means the plant has a virus. Uh, this is another type of, of virus so this is called aster yellows and this infects carrots and you can see this witch broom type pattern to the top of the carrot and then you get some strange looking carrots that are really unsaleable. Uh, so the, this uh, viral disease moves around in the aster leafhopper. So we know that we control the aster leafhopper and then we get control of the viral disease. So the last type of pest I'm going to talk about are the weeds. And there's a couple of different categories of leaves or of weeds. So knowing which type of weed you're dealing with is important. Uh, velvet leaf is here in the picture and this is an example of a summer annual. Summer annual weeds uh, germinate and grow and die, usually flower and go to seed and die all within one season. And that particular plant never comes back again. Um, and the reason we want to control summer annuals is they usually grow pretty quickly and they compete uh, with our vegetable plants or, uh, very much so within the growing season. So we want to control them within the growing season to keep them from stealing light, nutrients, and water from our crop plants. The other thing to be careful for is not letting these type of weeds go to seed. These seeds can last in the soil for velvet leaf up to 80 years. So if you're leaving this to go to seed, you're creating future problems for yourself. This uh, weed is called purslane, and this one crawls along the soil surface. Again, this is a summer annual, so it grows 
flowers, seeds, and dyes all within one growing season. Uh, another summer annual is pigweed. This is red root pigweed, and you can tell characteristic by the red bottom to it. Um, this one also grows very quickly during the growing season. Uh, this is an example of a winter annual. So winter annuals uh, germinate in the fall. They start to grow with this little set of leaves, and then they overwinter and flower first thing in the spring. So these particular ones are important to try to control in the fall. Even after we're done with vegetable production for the season, sometimes we need to do something to control the weeds that are growing. Uh, this is Canada thistle. This is a perennial. So this one is, uh, lasts for more than one season and most vegetable growers know this one because it's a particular problem. Uh, perennials are a problem year after year after year so you want to try to get control of them. They also store a lot in the root system so you need to really take care of killing the root system as well. And this particular plant can store a lot in the root system and send up shoots in a, a wide area. This is one more perennial. This is called quack grass, and you can see this uh, creeping rhizome that creeps along and then shoots up, shoots uh, periodically. And this one is a particular problem. If you try to use tillage to take care of it, you can cut these up, and then you create three new plants for yourself instead of one by chopping it up. And the tiller typically moves it around, which creates problems in new areas for you. So the last section I'll talk about is dealing with pests. An integrated approach to managing pests is usually best. Pesticides work well in conjunction with other management practices. So trying to avoid pests is best and then use a pesticide after those measures, after you've done all of those other measures. And here's some examples of those. Um, and I'll show you some pictures as examples, but things like sanitation and cleaning up, like I mentioned with the fungal diseases, cleaning up leaf litter can help a lot to prevent problems next year. Planting uh, your vegetables earlier or later to try to avoid pests that might be coming at a certain time of the year. Using mulches to try to deal with weeds instead of using herbicides. You can use things like trap crops that will attract insect pests to them. Instead of them going to your vegetable garden, they'll go to your trap crop and you can kill them there. Uh, floating row cover, I'll show an example uh, of what that looks like. Using crop rotation and moving your plants around, those particular families that are related to each other, those should be moved to different parts of the garden every year or the farm every year so that you're not getting the pests right there that can attack that same vegetable again. Uh, cover crops can help to prevent weeds and build your soil and make your plants more resistant to uh, pests. Just generally keeping your plants healthy by using enough fertilizer and watering them enough to avoid so that they're healthy enough to stand up to pests. And then removing alternative hosts. A lot of times our weeds can serve as alternative hosts and be a problem. So we want to try to get rid of those for that reason too. So here's an example. This is late blight that we talked about earlier, and this is a perfect example of why you want to clean up at the end of the year. This overwinters in the fruits or in the plant material, and so you could just reinfect yourself year after year if you don't get rid of this by burning it or throwing it away. Um, this is little brassica seedlings, and we talked about flea beetle earlier. You can avoid flea beetles, kind of the first, one of the first insects out. If you plant a little bit later, you may be able to avoid flea beetle issues. This is floating row cover. Uh, floating row cover can be used over the top of different types of vegetables to protect them from vegetable pests, like insects. It can also help to protect from diseases. Water and sunlight can get through these, so that's, they work fine for that. They, they're, the plants are a little warmer under there too, so they tend to grow a little bit faster. Um, you just have to make sure that you seal down the side with either sandbags or soil. Uh, mulches, this is a plastic mulch, but you could also use organic matter like straw for a mulch, but that helps to keep weeds down in the plant row. Crop rotation, I mentioned moving plant families from one part of the garden to the next part of the garden to the next so that you're not putting them in the exact same place every year is important. 
Uh, this is blue Hubbard squash, which really the cucumber beetle really loves this. And this is an example of a trap crop. You could plant this somewhere far away from your um, cucurbit plants and hopefully all the cucumber beetles would go there and leave yours alone and you could even spray that area with the blue hubbard squash to get rid of them rather than playing your spraying your crop plants uh, this is cover crops which i talked about a little bit these are cover crops are crops that you grow uh, that are not your cash crop you grow them in the opposite times of the season and this helps to compete with weeds like in the fall if you planted them after your vegetables were done they can try to take care of some of those winter annuals they are they also help improve your soil uh, so talking about when to use pesticides, another thing to keep in mind is thresholds. So you don't always want to spray, uh, especially insecticides, at the first sign of having an insect problem because things like the lady beetle, which is eating your aphids, you can mistakenly kill this by using an insecticide and now you've killed the insect that's helping you keep control. So we have thresholds that we recommend for different insects and you can look those up and to know what, uh, what's the, the most amount of insects you can have on that plant or the least amount before you should start spraying. Uh, you can also use different ways of monitoring and maybe not an individual farmer would do this, but um, things like this happen by researchers across Wisconsin where they're monitoring the movement of insects in a black light trap or with these sticky traps and there's uh, a resources on the internet that can help you know when insects are going to be coming in and you should be looking for it to do some management practices. So getting to pesticides, um, there are lots of different types of pesticides available. The problem is is that people think that because they're so readily available that they're safe and that's just not true. Uh, pesticides can be very dangerous and they need to be used, very, used appropriately. How do we know how to use them appropriately? You need to read the label. A label provides you with exactly how much you should be using, when you should be using them, and on what plants you should be using them. And if a pesticide is not labeled for something, you cannot use it for that. So it's very important, even when we see things that are available to us, even at the grocery store, that we understand that they can be a dangerous, they can be effective, but they can also be dangerous and they have to be used appropriately. Uh, and lastly, I want to just mention organic production. A lot of uh, people seem to think that organic production simply means that you don't use pesticides, and that's not true. There are organic pesticides available to farmers. They're typically made from uh, natural products, but that doesn't mean that they're safe. We have uh, arsenic is a natural product, but that doesn't mean that it's safe for us. So we have to be very careful, even with organic pesticides, to make sure that we are using them appropriately. Uh, organic production also includes lots of cultural practices to resist weeds. So if a farmer wants to become organic, they need to really look at what that means to be organic and learn from someone and understand that they'll have to be certified uh, to become that. And that's the end of my presentation on pests and pest management. Uh, thank you very much.